I, he was at the game. Uh, and I, I had something in my hand and I wanted to throw it at the TV. You know. And, and then right shortly, not too long ago, we had the Broncos we had to deal with. The drive cost us a chance for to go to the Super Bowl. And then Ernest Biner fumbled the ball. And I remember distinctly, those are back-to-back -back years, I was sick for a week after each of those games, Brother Jenkins. We'll go to work and I won't talk to nobody. Just mad. What's about some Browns? And I knew a couple of them, so I, it, it, took, I, it took it to heart a little more. I said, I don't know any of these dudes now. I ain't losing my mind over this stuff no more, man. I'm just, hey, they, it is what it is. I'm not, I'm not breaking my neck to get out of here to go and set the grill up and get ready for the game. Now, I'm just not doing that. If those of you that are doing that, that, that's your choice. But the transformation that I have gone through over the years, it just, it just doesn't move me like it used to, John, when I was really, really into it. And I coach now, and I love the game, but I'm not losing my mind over this stuff. And uh, it's not healthy, it's not worth it. I just don't have three hours to sit down and watch a game. Seriously, um, you know, after coaching all week, I'm kind of tired of football for a minute. But I just find more joy reading the Bible for three hours than watching a game intently and losing my mind. I just, I'm just not there anymore. Those of you that, that are into that, that's, that's, your, that's what you do. But I was telling my father, I said, I just, I'm just not there anymore. It just doesn't seem to be what drives and moves me, Demetrius, and motivates me. You know, at work, we'll be talking about the game. Everybody talking, man, we're wearing brown, brown's colors tomorrow at work, like some of your jobs will. Uh, or Indians gear, because the Indians are still trying to be in the playoffs. And I have gear, and uh, if I wear it, I'll wear it, but I ain't going to lose my mind. I don't care what, whatever happened in the game tonight. I'm going to go to sleep whether they win or lose. Years ago, man, I couldn't go to sleep, Mark. I'd be so, that brown, man, you made me sick. I'm Jones, man, you know. And I'd be up to 3 o'clock in the morning, and then, you know, trying to go to work, Marquis, tired, mad, and everybody mad, everybody crazy the next day at work. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Let me figure out. Okay, okay. So, so yeah, you know, go Browns, but, uh, you, know, I, you know, I'm going home. <laughs> I'm going home. Uh, my, my, my nephew, I think, has come from Washington, uh, Virginia, to come to the game tonight. Uh, Phyllis's brother has flown in from Atlanta to go to the game tonight. Uh, okay, good. good. Go ahead and have a good time. Uh, I don't know when the last time I bought a ticket to a game. I can't go anyway because it's 1 o'clock. <laughs> we have 4 o'clock service. Where Brother Willie at? He at the game. I'm not going to get out of, out, of, out of the parking till 5 o'clock. This, this would be a good game to go tonight because, you know, I'm not going to preach that long, even though I need to hurry up. And, uh, <laughs> and I could have got out and went to the game. It would have been okay. But Jinx would get in my car, you know, change my clothes, drive on down there. I could have done that and had thought about it. But I, game's going to be over at 11. By the time I get out, get out of here, it's 12. By the time I get home, it's 1. By the time I fall asleep, it's two. I just can't do that no more. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Back in the day, I could stay up like that. I, at 10 o'clock, wherever I'm at, I'm <laughs> snapping my neck. Just, I just can't do it no more. Yeah, hey, 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 hey. Anyway, let me, that's not my sermon, but that was just part of a conversation anyway. And I, I just wanted to share that. And uh, I don't know if that helps anybody or not. Um, Therefore, whatever you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. 
I thought about that verse when we were singing, do all in the name of the Lord. Um, and word or deed as God decreed, do all in the name of our blessed Lord. And may we take heed to that in everything that we do say and think. Give glory and honor to God and our decisions about what we do will please our Lord and Savior. Amen. Lord, we thank you for tonight. We ask your blessings upon the word as it is delivered to your people. Um, may it prick our hearts, may it encourage us, may it nourish us, may it build us up in our most holy faith. And we're thankful to be here tonight to, to worship with those who weren't with us this morning. And may our presence with them tonight encourage their hearts for being here tonight, that we all will have our great fellowship together one with another, and also with you. We thank you through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Uh, let's look at the last part of the first paragraph uh, that we started this morning, looking at um, verses 8 and following. And next week we'll start with verse 12. Uh, a little bit more familiar passages that you have grown accustomed to when we are pressing toward the mark of the higher calling in Christ. And that'll be for next week. We're going to finish up, though, this first paragraph, verses 8 through 11 of chapter 3 of Philippians. We'll dealt with the first half this morning. Um, we'll make reference to it tonight um, and then move on through the rest of the first paragraph. Yet indeed I count all things is verse 8 loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is from the law but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God by If you trust in this world's goods, where your decisions are measured, and you trust more in these things than what is important to God, you will lose your soul. Why? because they become more important to you than God should be. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Trusting in this world's goods, the, the, all of the accomplishments, all the things we try to manage in this life, they become more important than God is to us, there is going to be a loss of your soul. Paul says that all of this stuff that I have gained and everything that I could put confidence in in my flesh in verse 4 and that I have more reason to do so than anybody else because that I am a true Israelite, a tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee, and all the things concerning the law. If anybody can boast about who they are, about their race, about their ethnicity, about their ancestry, about everything 
that you accomplish in life, I have done it all. But I look at Christ and know that none of this is important as gaining him. He gained all these things with, with passionate zeal in verse 6 and now realize that it was all but loss when he found the Lord. One of the great statements uh, ever made from the lips of Christ we will find in the book of Matthew chapter 16 verses 25 and 26. It's mentioned in several of the Gospels. But we'll look at Matthew's account. Paul makes some very personal statements, some of what I've mentioned already, which seems to suggest what he went through eternally at some point during his conversion. We find that conversion in the book of Acts. Now, I don't want you to lose Matthew. Just hold on to that. But I want you to look at, look at Acts first. Acts chapter 9. I'm not going to assume that everybody's familiar with this, but uh, Floyd, if you could read Acts 9 for us. Um, I'll let you know when to stop. So hold Matthew 16, and let's look at Acts chapter 9 first. Are you there, Floyd? Excellent. Okay, now Christians were called the way before they were called Christians at Antioch. Okay, Jesus said, I am what? The way, the truth, and the life. So they described Christians as followers of the way. Okay, and that's what that verse is uh, referencing. Verse 3, Floyd. Okay, so this is the outward manifestation of what happened to Paul, okay? Now the Lord threw him to the ground, got his attention, they had this conversation. But what's remarkable is that Paul recognized that it was the Lord. Who out there didn't This is the same Lord who he was been persecuting. He was so zealous for what he believed in that, that, uh, he was on his way to bound Christians and, and to have them killed because they were not following the laws of the Pharisees, the law of Moses, something that he believed in mightily. We found that when this morning and also just reading being a Hebrew of Hebrews. Christians didn't follow, the, follow that, okay? They were followers of the way. They were following grace and truth. So, he recognized the Lord. He knew all about what the Christians taught. 
because this was contrary to what he believed. He recognizes the voice of the Lord and who Jesus was and then relented having met the Lord and says, what do you want me to do? Luke doesn't record all of what go, went on inside of Paul. He just records this action that took place. Okay? In Philippians 3, where we're at tonight, is what all that went on inside of him. The decisions he had to make regarding who he was and what he lived for. He gave all of that up to follow the Lord, okay? So when you read Acts 9, we need to bring Philippians 3 in so we now get what happened in an outward manifestation to what goes on and went on inside of him to help him with the decisions. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, that'll make a little more sense a little later, so hold on to it. Now I do want you to go to Matthew 16. Okay? What a tremendous statement that Jesus makes. 16, 25 and 26. For whosoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And this is the question that every man and woman needs to ask themselves. What are you willing to give up to save your soul? And Paul is talking in monetary terms monetary terms, such as what Jesus is making references to. We're talking about an exchange going on. Okay? What are you going to exchange to gain something? You give your life to gain the life of Christ. Is that worth it to you? Everybody's got to come to grips with that. What am I willing to do to gain eternal life? Is it that important to me or, or am I accomplishing the world more important? What if it profits you to gain the whole world and lose your soul? The question is to see what you mean to tell me you want all this stuff here that's temporary, that's going to fade away and lose your soul in eternity? That doesn't make sense. So Jesus asked, what will a man give in exchange? How important is it to you? When you think about that and come to grips with your answer, then you will know what you are willing to do for the cause of Christ. Let's look at Matthew 13. Let's turn to there. Okay? Matthew 13. In Matthew 13, we're going to see two brief parables. Matthew 13, verse 44 and verse 45, the parable of the hidden treasure is the first one. Okay? If you there, say amen. Okay. Matthew. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Verse 44. Verse number 44, 1344. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a tr hidden treasure. A treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid, and for the joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has 
and buys that field. Verse 45, the parable of the, of the pearl. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Both parables show us that salvation was so important to both these merchants that they were willing to give up everything to get it. And the question on the floor is, when you look at your life, is salvation that important to you that you're willing to give up everything to save your soul? I know you're thinking, because I can see the thought bubbles in your head. Okay? And that's the question tonight. What are you willing to give up? Now, the rich young ruler had a different response, didn't he? Huh? Didn't he have a different response? Uh, 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 in, in, in Matthew 19, when he says, Teacher, what do I have to do to give eternal life? All right? Now, let's look at his response. Floyd, if you can get 1916 and read for, for us Jesus and the rich young ruler. Matthew 19, verse 16. Everybody there? Okay, go ahead, Floyd. This young man was not willing to give up all he had. Okay? All right? Because those possessions meant more to him than his eternal soul. And again, the question for you, what are you willing to give up in exchange for your soul? Okay? There are many things that continue to plague you and tempt you and entice you to hold on to and give up some things but not all things. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be. Jesus wants your whole heart, not just parts of it. You're in a relationship, you don't want the part of a heart just from the person you're with, you want them to give themselves to you, not just a, a little bit. That's not going to be a good enough relationship. God doesn't want us a little bit of our heart. He wants our whole heart. But we want to hold on to things because they are important to us. We're not ready to leave this life because we love these things too much. And they're going to fade away. That car has that new smell, car smell to it, about one month. And then it smells like the rest of our cars. 
None of this stuff is going to last. We need to quit living like we're going to have it forever. We are here temporarily. And everything we got is temporary. And we got to live our lives like we're living on earth getting ready to go and to be in eternity. Here's a, here's a story. Uh, shoe salesmen, shoe repair salesmen, they don't have much of those anymore, but, but, but uh, Brother Ted couldn't afford to buy a new pair of shoes every time they wore out. Okay, and I know young people have no idea what I'm talking about. But on 143rd in Kinsman, there was a shoe repair shop. Okay, and I lived on 149th. Uh, and so what I do change is when my shoes will wear down, I needed a new sole and heel on it. Instead of buying a whole new pair of shoes for it, which I couldn't afford, so the branch I would take them to the shoe repair guy, and he would fix them for about a third of the price of a pair of new shoes, Brother Jenkins. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Okay. All right? So there was this, this shoe repair salesman. And the guy was trying to get there. It was five, he was closing at 5 o'clock, and he got there like about a minute before, and he was putting the clothes, uh, clothes sign up, and he knocked on the window and said, please, can I just drop my shoes off? Please let me in. So the, the, the shoe repairman let him in. He says, please take my shoes and, and repair them. I'm going to need them in a day or so and, and take care of that for me. And he's, then he asked the shoe repairman this question, Mark. He says, I don't see any cars in the parking lot. How are you going to get home? He says, you see those stairs right there? I walk up those stairs. I live up there. I just work down here. Y'all missed that. We work down here. We live upstairs. Okay? We live upstairs right now in heavenly places. Quit acting like this is your home. This world is not your home. You're just passing through. Okay? So, giving up this stuff shouldn't be that hard for people who are spiritually minded and can't wait to see the Lord. The rich young rulers, nah, I'm not ready for that. I ain't trying to do that. And he went away sorrowful because he had a lot of possessions that he wasn't willing to give up for his soul. We read about another example when the, when, the, when the other ruler who had all these barns, had this barn full of stuff, right? What am I going to do with all this, all of this, all of my crops, all of my produce? I'm going to build more barns, bigger barns, okay? The Lord says, okay, you fool. Your soul is going to be required if you deny. And then what is all this going to do? What are you going to do with all this now? As Mark said last week, uh, uh, ain't no U-Hauls attached to the hearses. They ain't taking none of this stuff with you. Okay? Have it, use it, but don't put your heart and soul into this stuff. And there are people who aren't willing to give up what it's going to take for eternal life. Paul, give me a couple minutes. Paul said a resounding yes on the road to Damascus when he met the Lord. And in Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 and following, he said, all this stuff is but loss cause of what I gain in Christ it is rubbish to me and he realized in 
verse number 9 and 10, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. Knowing Christ should be more important to us than anything else. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3.18 When we come to this mindset and decision, Jesus said, what will a man give in exchange of his soul? 